So uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, be able to present to you uh, today on uh, research that we have done for uh, several years really on um, the problem of falls and injuries in older adults. And uh, we've looked at this from different perspectives, but primarily because we're a biomechanics lab here in uh, BPK at SFU, we, we take that lens in, in studying the problem. We are concerned not only, as you'll hear, with preventing falls, but also with preventing injuries. All right, I'm looking around the room, but now I know where to steer. Um, so let's review the injuries that are associated with falls in, in older adults. Hip fracture is probably uh, the most important injury in terms of incidence, uh, in terms of cost to the sufferer, economic cost to society. 25% of people die within one year after experiencing a hip fracture, and about 95% of hip fractures are due to falls. Um, the, the one that may be debatable in terms of just as important, and in, indeed we'll, we'll hear that it's growing importance, is traumatic brain injury. Um, while there has been a leveling in the incidence of hip fractures uh, with, with age, the age-adjusted incidence of hip fractures really leveled off over the past few years, with traumatic brain injury we're seeing a doubling or a tripling in the incidence of TBI related to falls in older adults. And, and part of this is due to medications, anticoagulants, that there are fewer contraindications, there are new classes of drugs that people are on to treat uh, things like atrial fibrillation. Um, the cost of that is, that is that if someone impacts their head in a fall, the risk for hemorrhage is much greater. The risk for traumatic brain injury is much greater. I also list uh, wrist fractures and spinal cord injuries, or spinal cord injuries very serious, but not as frequent. Wrist fractures are as frequent as hip fractures, but it's really rare, really unheard of, that someone will die of a, of a wrist fracture. <clears throat> so falls are complex, and, and injuries are complex, and, and preventing uh, these events is, is a complicated problem, in part because it's not only physiological. Uh, there are many physiological risk factors for falls, but it's also environmental and behavioral and it, the interaction between these things. And, and we'll see some evidence, I'll present quite a lot of evidence today on um, what happens, how do falls actually occur, a project where we're, we're recording video to gather that information. And, and you know, we'll come back to this point of the complex interactions in the etiology of falls. Now, if we return to think about injury and the notion that most falls, even in older adults, are what we might call benign events. I mean, we think that any fall in an older adult is a serious event. Uh, I don't think any fall on the soccer pitch for you know, a teenager is a serious event. But it's worth thinking, like, okay, what are the factors that separate injurious and non-injurious falls? Why are injuries so much more common in, you know, for older adults if they fall? Um, well, yeah, the, the, the problem may be that someone is falling frequently, that they have physiologic uh, risk factors that are affecting that. But those physiologic factors are probably also affecting the typical severity of a fall. There's a given amount of energy in a fall, we normally have very effective uh, mechanisms for managing that energy. I often talk about falls as like an energy management problem. But with those physiologic declines, <clears throat> we're probably seeing an increased severity in, in a given fall. We'll see, for example, how frequent head impact is in falls in older adults. The third factor, of course, that we can't neglect is tissue changes that occur with age, osteoporosis. Um, causes a decline in the ability of a bone to withstand a traumatic event without fracturing. Similar changes occur in brain tissue with age that reduce the resistance of that tissue to, to injury. 
Now I made a point about traumatic brain injury and here's some of the data that support what I was saying is that there's a two to three fold increase over the past 10 years and this has been shown in studies from various places, Australia, uh, the US, um, Finland, um, and as I said, it's thought to be linked to the increased use of anticoagulants. So the research we do, and we've enjoyed a partnership for many years with Fraser Health, and in particular two long-term care homes associated with Fraser Health, that um, have in a sense become real-life laboratories for us to study falls. And this has really moved our research forward. Um, I'll talk to you about all of the technologies that you see here. Um, video capture of falls, I mentioned that we're recording real-life falls. We're also doing work on wearable sensors to automatically detect falls, to sort of, you know, provide, like a black box, provide you with information on what were the circumstances of the falls. Um, and I'm going to talk about two specific lines of research related to interventions. One is wearable hip protectors, a piece of uh, protective padding that is typically integrated into undergarments. And um, this is for high risk individuals and also compliant flooring. You think about modifying playgrounds to make them safer for kids when they fall. The, the, the rationale and strategy is similar here to place uh, a compliant sublayer beneath vinyl to reduce the risk for injury. So starting with the work we've done on video collection, um, this has been ongoing now for close to 10 years and uh, working with these two long-term care homes in the Vancouver area, we have cameras in common areas. So hallways, um, dining rooms, lounges, no cameras in, in bedrooms or bathrooms for privacy. We work with the long-term care homes to, add to, to review fall incident reports and that guides the collection of video footage. And as you see to date, we've collected um, 1,741 falls in 535 residents. Uh, we've used a structured questionnaire to analyze those data. And for many of the residents in the homes, we also have separate consent for them to, uh, that provides us with access to their medical records and an additional consent for sharing of the images in the video for educational purposes. So all the images that I'm showing today we have that consent for sharing of those images and video. So here's <clears throat> the population that we're talking about. And no doubt the, the long-term care population is getting more and more frail. Um, the average age of the people that we've recorded falling is 82. You can see that 62% of them are, are female. And here we see you know, a distribution of disease diagnose, diagnoses and medications which you know, shows you that really there's either a combination of um, both cognitive impairment and physical impairment, that is the reason why the individual is in long-term care, or at least one of those conditions. Now, here you see a distribution of injury, and we see that on about 20, I think it's about 22% now of falls there is at least one injury documented on the fall incident report. And the striking thing here is that 47% of these injuries are to the head. So we're talking mainly about bruising, tenderness, lacerations. Concussions are rarely diagnosed in part because it is challenging to separate the neural effects of the, the impact to the head from baseline cognitive impairment that may be there. But uh, you'll see, and I'm, I'm warning you now, I'll warn you again, I'll show you some videos that are hard to watch that show um, the types of head impacts that we're talking about here. Um, about 1%, 1.5% of falls create hip fracture, and we'll come back to that. So, some of the people who are residents in these long-term care homes experience numerous falls 
And this gives you an idea of the distribution that over 222 people, um, on average, there's about four falls each. But you can see that for a handful of individuals, we have over 40 falls recorded on video. So these are indeed very frequent callers. So let's look at some videos. And um, sometimes there's a single obvious uh, modifiable cause of the fall. So, for example, this gentleman, and this is something that we see quite common, um, sitting back and the brakes were not locked for the wheelchair. So I use this as an example, like we need to develop better wheelchairs. Wheelchairs that have self-locking brakes, but that chair will not move until the person is fully seated. Here's another fall that there is an obvious cause and solution. This woman appears to see that uh, lift device in the hallway. She tries to steer around it, but doesn't quite make it. That device shouldn't be in the hallway. Although if you've recently visited a hospital, you'll probably agree with me that there's just a multitude of equipment in the hallways of hospitals where people walk. Patients are um, trying to remobilize themselves, so uh, we need to fix that problem. Here's something that's maybe less easy to treat, but I think we can see that there's an obvious cause here of this fall, that this woman is very unsteady. And um, she has excessive sway, she's stumbling, um, maybe it's an issue of medication. Um, one thing you'll note as we play this fall is how severe her impact is. Even though she doesn't impact her head, you really get a sense of how severe the impact that that fall is. And in part, it's because she's falling on a concrete floor with vinyl covering. Here's a situation where a woman has a disease, Parkinson's, that affects this fall. You can see that she is rotating, she's trying to turn, um, but her feet remain in place too long and a fall ensues. Another you know, complex aspect of falls is that as we encourage people to be mobile and in this case to engage in physical activity, in recreational activity, which has social as well as physical benefits, we might actually be increasing the risk for falls. So here's a fall that occurs as this gentleman is playing, uh, doing an activity with a ball, and he ends up falling. Now, here's an example that I think illustrates more you know, of the complexity of falls, in that this woman is attempting to transfer from her walker to the chair she doesn't get close enough to the chair to begin with, and she has this challenge of transitioning unsupported. And then she finally grabs hold of the chair, which moves, and um, so, so here, do we have a combination of cognitive impairment, physical impairment? That is you know, the likely story here. But preventing falls in scenarios like this is very challenging. Now, here's another fall that I put up to illustrate, I think, more obviously, the dilemma of the care provider. And I sometimes get the question when people look at the data that I presented, like, 40 falls in one person. Like, how can the staff allow that to happen? Well, let's look what happens here. This care provider, I think you'll agree, is doing really everything that she should. She's encouraging safety, but mobility and independence. She's trying to remind the woman, <clears throat> here's your walker, to hand the walker to the woman. But a fall ensues. So we know that physical restraints are not the solution. Uh, chemical restraints are not the solution. But still, as you know, we think about encouraging independence and mobility, we have to recognize that it, you know, we are 
perhaps increasing risk for falls. Now I mentioned, and I'm going to start showing you some results of you know, what we see from analyzing this large video database, 1,700 falls, um, but just a few words on, on our approach for analysis. So we've developed this structured questionnaire <coughs> that divides the fall in a sense into three stages, or focuses on three stages, the initiation, the descent, and the impact stage. So in the initiation stage, we're interested in things like what was the person doing at the time of the fall? What was the cause uh, or nature of imbalance? Was it a trip or a slip? Um, we're interested in the direction of the fall. But you'll see there's interesting observations about fall direction, that the initial fall direction may not be the same as the end fall configuration. So we're interested in things <coughs> in the descent stage like rotations, as well as attempts to recover balance. Do people seem to be recognizing that they have lost their balance and they're trying to recover with stepping or grasping? In the impact stage, we're interested in what body parts contact the ground. And again, like what was the, the direction, the landing configuration? So for each of those questions, we have specific responses we force the team of three raters who are analyzing each video to select the best answer. There's no like can't tell, don't know. They have to select the best answer among the responses and then they also specify their confidence in uh, that answer being correct. And we've done a lot of work to validate the inter-rater reliability of the questionnaire and um, to refine it and we're at a a pretty good stage in that regard. So let's look here at the combination of what people were doing, the activity at the time of the fall, which is on the, the vertical, and the cause or nature of imbalance. So you'll see that the largest category of cause of imbalance is what we call incorrect weight shifting. And that means things like excessive sway, like that woman that we saw who was swaying so much. It also means things like a misstep during walking. Uh, it means things like, you know, getting up from a chair and not, you know, regaining balance as, or maintaining balance as you rise, or even the same kind of thing during descent. And we see indeed that this class of imbalance is common during walking, transferring, and standing. Whereas something like, you know, trip stumble, of course, you know, it's most more common during walking. It's also a high category. But we also see loss of support with an external object as a very common cause of falls. But, you know, one thing you can see here is that if you look at the combination of all falls during transferring, whether it's like stand to sit or sit to stand, that is as common a cause or, or a scenario where falls occur as walking. So we've got to look in this population, even at standing balance, very important, as well as transferring and walking. So that, that has implications not only for risk screening, but also for exercise, for physiotherapy, for interventions. Now, I'm, I, okay, so, so here, you know, we sort of see this scatter plot that I'm taking the exact same data and I am showing it in a different format here. This is a so-called mosaic plot, but it's the exact same data. I just introduced it because I'm going to use this format in a couple additional slides. Again, so the one, it's like a, it's like a stack bar graph, but um, the specific thing about the mosaic plot is that the width of each bar corresponds to how common that category is. So you see incorrect weight shifting is a much wider bar, 47%, than slip, which is 1%. And it's worth noting, uh, now that I mentioned that, you know, slips are rarely a cause of falls in long-term care. And I've had a lot of people say to me, like, who are interested in slips in the workplace, like, how can that be? Well, I think they're especially attentive to, like, not having slipping hazards. But, uh, yeah, for a young, healthy person, a trip or a slip is, you know, the more common mechanism of a fall. But for an older adult who has all these physiologic risk factors, 
uh, that slips are rare. Okay, so I've been talking about fall direction, and I already kind of alluded, but here I'm showing this thing that, that the initial fall direction is not necessarily the same as the landing configuration. And I think, you know, this has interest in, in terms of like, we'll, we'll sort of develop this model of, of motor coordination of, of safe landing during falls. And I think, you know, I, what I'm hoping is by the end of the talk, you'll agree with me that it's not only young people who have an ability to coordinate their movements during a fall, to, to, to rearrange their body segments <coughs> using, you know, specific safe landing strategies that we'll talk about, so that a fall becomes a less benign event. I mean, it's rare that we see a video where someone just topples over and doesn't do anything to try and protect themselves. So a lot of that protection we'll see relates to fall direction. And what we see is this clear tendency for people to want to rotate backward. So if they start out and they fall forward, which you see the initial fall direction was 19% of the time forward, but look how common it is that they end up landing sideways. That's the blue bar right here. About a third of forward falls ended up landing sideways. Similarly, about a third of sideways falls end up landing backwards. All right, so you're falling forward, you often end up rotating to land sideways. You're falling sideways, you often rotate to land backwards. Why is this? The one direction where we don't see a lot of rotation is backward, that if people start falling backward, they'll end up landing backward. So keep that in mind as we talk about some other aspects of balls. Um, and I'll give a big hint, it's about head protection. Right? So before getting to head protection, let's talk a little bit about hip. And, you know, we, we, I'll talk to you about cases of hip fracture, but let's just look at hip impact. And we see that 42% of falls involve impact to the side of the pelvis. Equally right, left, much more common uh, is impact to the, the buttocks. 93% uh, like of falls involve impact to the pelvis. But yeah, a lot of the time, 40% um, of the time, 42% of the time, it's to, to the hip. Now, here's one implication of that whole thing that I was talking about of change in fall direction. Remember I said that forward falls, like a third of the time people end up landing sideways. So here we see that indeed, like the probability of impacting your hip was just as high in forward falls as it was in sideways falls, that about 60% of falls in those, in, with those initial fall directions ended up in hip impact. And this is an interesting point for us because, you know, we and others have been thinking like, oh, it's all about, with regard to hip fracture, it's all about medial lateral stability. Like, how stable are you in terms of preventing a fall sideways? How able are you to, like, step in a side, you know? But what we're showing here is that, like, walking and falling forward, you're just as likely, if you're an older adult in long-term care, to land on your hip as if you start out falling sideways. So again, assessment, prevention, implications for uh, physiotherapy and exercise. So let's look at um, a fall that ends up causing hip fracture. And this is a curious case for, in part, like what causes the fall. Is it a trip or is it a misstep? It highlights the dilemma that we also all often face in, in classifying that. But let's focus more on how much of the energy the fall is delivered to the pelvis with impact to the lateral aspect. This is an example where she starts out falling forward, but then she rotates during descent to land on her hip. She does contact the hand, but I think you'll agree with me, like the amount of energy she absorbs in that hand contact appears to be very low. So a lot of the energy the fall delivered to the hip. Another case of a fall causing hip fracture where we'll see this from a different view, where again you'll see the severity of impact to the hip. Uh, 
So, right now we have 25 hip fractures recorded on video. And if you look at the configuration of the body and what's going on in the loading, it's pretty similar to those examples that I showed. That um, often it's impact to the poster lateral aspect, uh, with the trunk upright, and a lot of the energy of the fall delivered to the lateral aspect of the hip. Here's the distribution. We see that um, very few of these falls involved transferring. They were either falling from standing or walking, so that involves a higher height, a greater potential energy for the fall. Um, only 8% of these cases was the fall on carpet. The vast majority of flooring in long-term care homes is either vinyl or concrete. Um, there's been a question that maybe you're aware of in the orthopedic community of spontaneous hip fractures. The notion that the fall was the result of the hip fracture. That, that muscle contraction during a daily activity may have caused this osteoporotic bone to fracture. And a fall ensues and is often thought perhaps to be the cause of it. Um, and there's all this evidence that, you know, maybe that's five or ten percent of fractures, like very, that, you know, surveys of patients, did they, did they uh, notice something occur, did they feel something give way before the fall? In those sort of surveys we see maybe five, ten percent of people, you know, describe that sort of thing. Also we think about like there's all these risk factors like impaired vision and muscle weakness that are risk factors for both falls and hip fracture. And, you know, it's hard to think like why would impaired vision increase risk for spontaneous fracture if that's, you know, a big part of the story. But the video evidence um, supports that notion that, um, in fact, only one out of 25 falls um, would be able to show, to see any sort of evidence that maybe a spontaneous fracture. And I think I have that in, uh, I thought it was the next slide, but we're coming to it. Um, here we're showing some uh, risk factors for hip fracture or, um, and, and in compared to falls that didn't result in, in uh, sorry, hip fracture. Um, so it's a lot of the things that I was talking about, like falling sideways, landing sideways, falling while walking or standing, etc. All right, so here's that case where was it a spontaneous fracture? Even here, I don't think that there's strong evidence that that was the case. I think her ankle gives way, but possibly. But all, all the other ones didn't have anywhere close to this sort of level of, of evidence. So, one thing that we've been interested in is, you know, so what's happening under the skin? Like, you know, we've done all these experiments that I'll describe where we've measured forces applied to the hip region. But how does that translate to stresses in the bone? And in this particular study, we were interested in, like, how does that depend on the muscle forces that are spanning the hip? If you think about the stresses that are produced in the bone, yes, a lot of it will be due to this impact force that is applied to the greater trochanter. But there are muscles spanning the bone, and perhaps those muscles are protective. And indeed, we, showed, we, we found through the study where we did a combination of uh, mechanical models with a hip impact uh, pendulum that I'll describe um, in greater detail in a couple slides, but we were able to stimulate in this experiment the hip abductor muscles and tense them to varying degrees. And what we saw is that a threefold increase in muscle force within the physiologic range reduced peak stress by 25%. So you think like, oh, 25%, maybe that's not so great, but really that's on par or even greater than the difference you might expect from an osteoporosis medication, from bisphosphonate therapy if someone's on, uh, if someone has osteoporosis. So again, you know, and, and it kind of helps explain like, you know, this notion that you might have that strong people are less likely to injure during an impact event.
Now, what else might happen <clears throat> with aging? Okay, so maybe muscle weakness is, you know, not because you know the muscle is not protecting the bone because of weakness. But what about just the bulk properties of the soft tissue? We know that skin, fat, muscle, that whole soft tissue layer that overlies the greater trochanter, that there are changes with age in tissue properties. And indeed, in, in a study shown here where we use this shaker device to characterize the stiffness and damping of the tissues, we see that the stiffness goes down by you know, to a third of the value that it has in young. Now, you might think like, okay, isn't that good? Like it's less st stiff tissue. But what's going to happen is that tissue is going to bottom out during impact. And the, the issue is how much energy can it absorb before it bottoms out? And if it's less stiff, if it's only a third the stiffness, then the amount of energy that it can absorb is reduced by threefold. So that leads into a rationale for padding the body with hip protectors or padding the environment with compliant flooring. So I mentioned we have in our lab uh, a hip impact simulator. This has been um, developed with a lot of research, uh, which I'll quickly describe. But it um, allows us to simulate falls of different impact velocity. You'll see that we've measured impact velocity in our real life fall videos and matched that. Um, and a lot of the science here actually is not in this you know, fancy sort of pendulum device, but rather in the surrogate pelvis like the bones and the simulated soft tissues of the pelvis region here. So we've had people come into the lab um, and one thing that we have done is an experiment like this where you'll see in this video we just released the individual from a small height and they land on the hip and we characterize their response with a mass spring damper model. Here I'm just showing the mass and the spring. Those are the two most important things. It's like, what's the value of that mass, so-called effective mass? What's the value <coughs> of the spring stiffness of the body? And how linear or nonlinear is that? We've also measured the surface geometry of older women. Um, we've measured their soft tissue stiffness. And all this information goes into our surrogate pelvis. I, as I mentioned, we've met, uh, characterized from digitizing real life falls the impact velocity of the pelvis during a fall. And on average, it's about two meters per second. So then we've used all that information to ask questions like, well, how well do available, commercially available hip protectors work in protecting the hip? We can measure that with our hip impact simulator. So in this study, which we made some friends and some enemies, we, we took 26 commercially available hip protectors and we published the results showing that the attenuation, the reduction in force to the bone, to the femoral neck measured with a load cell in our proximal femur, um, it varied between 2% and 40%. And one device actually, under a certain situation, increased the force compared to the unpadded condition by, by concentrating that force and delivering more of it directly to the bone. So not all hip protectors are made the same, not all provide the same protective value. And it's interesting, there's these so-called hard shells that have like a rigid plastic cap over foam versus soft shell, which are just foam polymer all the way through. And the two, sorry, the, the top four performing devices, two of them were soft shell, two of them were hard, hard shell. So you, you can't tell just based on that. Thickness does influence things. And you know that's a big trade-off here. It's like, what is the thickness of a hip protector that people are willing to wear? So, kind of motivated in part by those results showing like it's kind of the wild west. There's at least 26 devices that we could easily get a hold, hold of. 
we see the performance is, is, is really uh, dramatically different. So we have worked with others to um, you know, work towards the development of a standard. We um, had a big milestone in that process in uh, this year where we have a freely downloadable um, express document on hip protectors uh, with CSA, Canadian Standards Association. Um, it describes something about background of hip protectors and specifically recommended approaches for mechanical testing. Now, Alex Quarles is a PhD student who um, graduated last year. She's now postdoc at University of Manitoba. And she extended <coughs> the research that we're doing on hip protectors into the sort of clinical realm where she did a one-year study where she examined falls in 13 long-term care homes in the Fraser Health region. And she had a couple different questions. One is, how many of those falls were people wearing protectors? And the second question is, did it matter? Was the risk for a hip fracture different if you were wearing a hip protector versus you weren't? And uh, surprisingly, perhaps there's a lot of confusion over that last issue from existing clinical trials, which you know have kind of had a lot of methodological problems. Um, Fraser Health is a unique region to study the problem because they have really done some pioneering work in implementation, in in addressing barriers and in increasing availability. Still, people have to pay for hip protectors, and we'll see that's that's a factor. But um, it really is a success story that 60% of people were wearing hip protectors when they fell. This was over 1,000 residents and over 3,500 falls. And one year, 13 long-term care homes. 60% uh, were wearing hip protectors. And did it make a difference? Yes. There was a threefold reduced risk for hip fracture if you were wearing a hip protector compared to falling without a hip protector. So that's a, a big difference. No effect on pelvic fractures or other kind of fractures. Now, what uh, were the factors that influenced acceptance and adherence to hip protectors? The big two were discomfort. This thing is not comfortable to wear. It's bulky. It's uncomfortable. And cost. Like, I don't have the money to pay for my mother's hip protectors or, you know, that sort of thing. There was also some other factors, appearance and, you know, this, um, you know, attitude from the resident, perhaps the family, but more often the resident, that they don't need the protection. So cost we see is a big one. Um, comfort is another one. one thing that we have ongoing in the lab right now is a product that's designed really specifically for acute care because that's another area where hip protectors, like there's a high risk for fractures, there's over a thousand hip fractures annually in Canadian hospitals. So it would seem like, you know, an older person comes into the hospital, they should be wearing a hip protector. There should be a type of hip protector that is easy to apply, that provides protection for the length of stay. So we're developing a stick-on hip protector with a skin-friendly adhesive uh, that this, this kind of adhesive can be worn for 21 days uh, and removed and put back on. It's a low-cost product and um, we continue to do work in refining the product, but it's um, very close to being ready to go. And it'll be interesting to see, does it achieve greater acceptance and adherence in the acute care environment compared to the garment-based approach, which is the more typical approach. Now, we're also doing some work with partners, uh, in this case, um, a company in Israel called Hippo, where we're going to the other end of the spectrum. Like, you know, one spectrum is like low cost, you know, easy to apply, um, take away that barrier to um, acceptance. This is the other end where it's way more force attenuation, in a sense, you know, greater protective value, um, but will everyone be able to afford? 
but uh, the technology is really coming along. Here you see me falling, and the device activates. So it detects that I'm falling using a sensor system, then inflates the airbag. Okay, so let's talk about head impact. And um, as I mentioned, like, there's a high percentage. What we see here is 32% of falls in long-term care result in head impact. And coming back to this whole kind of thing of like fall direction, what we see here is that forward falls created the greatest risk. That, that like there was a 50% chance that someone was going to impact their head if they fell forward. And what, sorry, what I should say is if their landing configuration is forward. All right, so, so this is like that high risk landing configuration that people are hitting their head. And I think that's part of why they're rotating. All right. Um, but, you know, let's gather a bit more evidence and we'll see whether you agree with me about that. We see that backward falls, well, there was a lower risk, like only about, you know, 27% chance of impacting the head. They were much more common, like 54% of falls, there was, they, the landing configuration was backward. So impact to the back of the head was the most common. 13% of all falls involves impact to the back of the head. Now, let's think for a minute about, okay, what's going on with those forward falls? Um, if you think about falling forward, you probably think, like, that's easy to avoid head impact. I'm just going to use my hands. Um, again, this is like a forward fall with a forward landing configuration. But I think at the same time, you did, you know, you've got to recognize and admit that that's a strength-demanding task. Um, and we've looked at it from different perspectives. One, in, you know, do older adults have trouble in moving their hands quickly enough? And in this early study, we, we didn't really see a lot of support for that notion. There is some slowing, but uh, it wasn't clear that that's the big factor. And I think the video evidence really supports that instead, the factor is strength. That even if you get your arms out, and even if they're in you know, a mechanically advantageous position, the ability to absorb the energy in the upper limbs is a strength demanding task. And um, we saw in this experiment uh, years ago that, that women, uh, young women, were, could absorb twice the energy as, as older women. And, okay, so. I'll send out that warning again. You guys have already seen some, some falls, but in this set of falls, we're addressing the issue of head impact. And uh, there are several falls that are difficult to watch. Uh, we'll start by looking at some falls where there is an attempt to arrest the fall with the arms, a forward fall, but it's unsuccessful. And head impact occurs. Okay, so I'm just going to pause this for a second. Here's the real warning. These ones are really hard um, to watch. These are backward falls. And remember, 13% like of backward landings involves head impact. And many times it is as severe as what we're going to see here, where the initial contact is to the pelvis. And then what is it? We're trying to examine this. Uh, there's uh, in the audience here, Natalie Shishov is a PhD student in my lab, a new PhD student who's especially interested in this issue of head impact avoidance and in, in backward falls. Is it trunk? Is it neck muscle control? What we'll see is this sort of whip-like motion that ends in a very severe impact to the head. And there's, I think, three different ones we'll see. And again, you think about the floor. how ludicrous it is when this is such a high-risk event, high-frequency event, that that floor is um, like that. Let's look at some more success stories. And when I see these, I'm like cheering, like, yeah, you know, you did it. Like, this gentleman has the strength and the strategy, the coordination uh, to avoid head impact. This is uh, a more gentle fall. Um, here's 
where backward rotation can be effective. Remember, the forward falls being the highest risk. If you have the core and the neck muscle control, I see that and I say, like, you know, that's just like how I would like to fall. So, so you know, you might think, like, oh, this problem of head impact, it is uh, the most frail individuals or the ones with cognitive impairment who are at risk. That is not the case. In fact, it's the ones who are more vigorous. We'll see that uh, here, there was, you were more likely to impact the head if you fell while walking and you initially fell forward. And what about the physiologic risk factors? Well, let's look at just these two. Dependent in daily activities. So that's kind of a physical performance measure. There was no association. So that did not associate with risk for head impact. Cognitive impairment is showing the odds ratio is on the other side of one. What that means is people who fell and were cognitively impaired, they actually had lower risk for head impact. And that relates to the activity. They were less likely to fall while walking, less likely to fall forward. Their falls tended to be more often during transferring. But again, it's not that it's only the, you know, cognitively impaired. In fact, it's the, the more intact who are impacting their head. Perhaps not surprising if you have poor vision, maybe related to like inability to visualize the environment, you're more likely to impact your head. And women were more likely than men to impact their head. Perhaps that relates to upper limb strength. I think I'll skip this one because of the time. And um, just talk for a few minutes about, okay, so what are we doing about head impact? Um, well, um, one thing is that we have worked with an exercise coordinator um, named Debbie Chung to design a program that we have now piloted that isn't quite explicit as, as this. It's like, you know, learn to avoid head impact, but it's incorporating into strength and uh, balance and agility training, like a sort of fall prevention program, this notion that let's not focus only on preventing falls and improving balance, um, but also on equipping people with the ability to land safely, to avoid head impact in particular. So upper limb strength, core and neck muscle strength, flexibility for rotation. These are all things that we're incorporating into this program that we successfully piloted in assisted living. Now, the flooring. I've mentioned it several times. It just seems to make sense, doesn't it? But it's not a simple problem. You think like, okay, well let's just put uh, compliant flooring down. But we have to think about how will that affect wheelchairs? How will that affect wheeled equipment like lifts? Um, you know, are we creating ergonomic issues for staff? All these things that we are learning about through um, a randomized controlled trial that I'll, I'll briefly describe, that the results actually are going to be available in early 2018. But just as a kind of prelude to like describe to you like, okay, how do we select the, the material for that trial? We did a lot of work testing different floors. We ended up working with a company that based on the results of our test, it was an iterative process for them to optimize the material. It's, um, it's a rubber sublayer that's 25 millimeters thick, and it's placed beneath hospital grade vinyl, so you take care of the hygiene issues and everything. Um, what we see here is that in tests done in Andrew Lang's lab at Waterloo, this type of flooring reduces impact force to the head by nearly 70% during simulated falls doesn't do quite as well for the hip because the hip is a softer region to begin with, but it does about as well as the best hip protectors, 35% reduction in force to the hip. It doesn't affect mobility and balance. So that's another part of the trade-off, is that if we made the floor too soft, then it's going to increase sway, it's going to affect uh, balance and mobility, and indeed, we saw that in tests that, you know, if we went to a really soft floor that provides like, you know, 65% attenuation, 
then um, we start impairing balance. But we can get 34% attenuation to the hip without impairing mobility and balance of older women. So here's the design of that um, RCT, uh, randomized controlled trial. It's in one of the partner long-term care homes that, in the Vancouver area where we randomized 150 bedrooms. And 75 of them got, uh, were renovated with the smart cell compliant flooring sublayer placed beneath the, beneath the vinyl. The other got renovated, but just with uh, plywood placed beneath the vinyl. And um, it, it's powered, the study is powered over four years duration to be able to deter, deter you know, answer the question, does is, is the risk for an injury in the event of a fall reduced by the compliant flooring? Uh, we're going to look at serious injuries as well as all injuries. We're also going to look at whether falls are increased uh, in locations where there's compliant flooring. So we're hoping that this will provide, uh, we don't know the results of the trial yet, of course we're optimistic, and we're hoping that it will provide a scientific basis for implementation to support, you know, we're also looking at cost effectiveness, which of course is very important. All right, so just to acknowledge the various people whose research contributed to this presentation and our funding agencies, CIHR, AgeWell, uh, Fraser Health, and Burnaby Hospital Foundation, among others, and thank you for your attention, your time, and I'm really looking forward to questions. Did you announce my email for questions, Daryl? Has that been told? Okay. No. Do I do that? <coughs> King? So if anybody has any questions right now and you're online, you can email Bemister, B-E-M-I-S-T-E-R, at sfu.ca, and we will take questions for the next 15 minutes. Yeah. As they come in. Okay, thank you. Any questions in the room? What's your next step, Steve? I know you're going into more uh, hockey and concussion. You can talk a little bit about that. Do you have any questions come in? Sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, falls in older adults is kind of the bread and butter of the lab, but we're, we're expanding and um, making some really interesting progress in the area of concussion and hockey. And, um, in a way, we are applying a lot of the same tools. So we have video cameras. We're working with the, the SFU men's hockey team, and uh, they have sensors in their helmets at all home games. We also have networks of video cameras around the ice. So we're looking at you know video analysis and then linking it to the sensor data on impact severity. But you know we, we've borrowed some tools from others, but really gathered, developed our own tools for analyzing the circumstances of those hits. So we want to know things like, well, what object impacted the head? Uh, turns out that the glass so far is number one, but close behind is the hands, the shoulder, the elbow. So, um, and, and if you look at like the most severe hits, many of them are shoulder and elbow. Uh, like about 71% that are above this sort of concussion threshold of 60 Gs. We um, are also doing some work where we're looking at modifications to shoulder pads. So like helmet, of course, crucial. People continue to do work to try and improve helmets. We also know that helmets are not really designed to prevent concussions, but they're designed to prevent more serious types of brain injury. So what about the shoulder pad? What about the elbow pad, even the gloves? Um, that's something that we are examining. We also may look at modifications to glass down the road, but right now we're focusing on the pad. I don't have any questions yet. <coughs> I have one question for you. What's your thought on the premise that in society we've made, we've made everything too flat, so people lack stability, lateral stability, which generally causes the rotation? <coughs> 
Um, it's an interesting question. Um, and it's one that uh, I looked over at Natalie because we've talked about um, in terms of, uh, you know, terrain and it's a complex thing I think like when you're when you're walking on a regular terrain there's a level of awareness of the environment uh, that 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 is a little different it's more demanding but I think you gather and incorporate that information so that if you do fall you know and let's say you're falling right on like you know a sharp tree trunk or something like you'll probably get your hands up you know it also, of course, relates to maybe what you're alluding to is just like provides you with more continuous challenge and, you know, ma maintenance of all the systems that are important to balance. But, um, yeah, we've thought a lot about that. Like, people fall and how, how do they know where the landing surface is and, you know, what if it's a regular terrain and there's obstacles and hazards and so on. <coughs> My reason for asking was that in the orthopedic sense, and that's more of my practices, we see, a, we see increasing weakness in the lateral hips, so IT band and support muscles and adductors as well, in general in the populations, are weakening over time because people are not exposed to variable surfaces as much. So those that are on non-flat surfaces, or out in nature more if you want to call it that, they tend to be less prone having weaknesses in those areas. Interesting. Right. It's an anecdotal suggestion, but it's still. <coughs> um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, you, you talked briefly about how it was so difficult to disentangle the cognitive impairment from the results of a concussion. Um, I know there's a lot of concussion work being done out here. Is there any work being done on specifically disentangling that right now in your lab? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we were talking before and, um, about Ryan Darcy's mm -hmm. research. And um, indeed that's something that uh, we are planning to collaborate. Uh, that there is a student in, that's, that's shared between Ryan's lab and our lab that is using a system that was developed by Ryan's group to use EEG to uh, you know, monitor concussion, or to, like to, to, to measure level of consciousness and relate that to concussive symptoms. So um, I guess similar to like neuropsych testing, you need sort of a baseline to then compare, but that's exactly what we've talked about is a study where we may do baseline measures with, you know, uh, high frequency fallers and then see what goes on after a fall, after a fall that involves head impact. So I've got a, a question online, and it's from Rohan Roy, who asks, how much does inner ear balance uh, issues play a part in falls, and was that considered when addressing falls? Um, it's a good question that I actually don't know the answer to in terms of like the prevalence of vestibular dysfunction in the nursing home <coughs> population that we're studying. Um, I mean, certainly it's going to be there uh, in a certain portion, but I, you know, whether it's a prevalent thing, um, we have, you know, thought this whole thing of rotation, maybe that has something to do with inner ear function and if someone has, you know, whether they tend to rotate in a fall or not, you know, uh, we used galvanic stimulation to test that in the lab, we didn't see any effects. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, a question. It's a good question. Um, if it is prevalent, it's probably rarely the single, like the only risk factor. And that's you know, again, worth stressing is that if you look at the physiologic profile of people who are falling, <coughs> it's rare that they'll just find a single abnormality, like this person has cataracts, so let's fix the cataracts. And unfortunately, it's not. It's usually not that simple. I don't have another question yet, but I want myself, Steve, unless somebody else has a... Okay. Um, for the kinesiologists that are listening online, what's your number one recommendation for them? And I know there's that exercise program where they could definitely influence some change, and are they able to see the exercises that are being, you know, recommended in that program? You, you put up a poster, but what's your, what's your advice to them? <laughs> 
because they may not be able to influence the compliant flooring or the right. But I think you know there's a huge potential for kinesiologists to take leadership roles in the area of falls in older adults. Um, you know, it's it's essential that you understand the multifactorial nature of the problem. But you know, things like exercise programs, um, things that may touch upon you know behavioral. Um, I mean, there's a big challenge in long-term care, and also in the community. In um, you know, who, who are the leaders? Who are who's available to provide the services to organize? Um, you know, one long-term care facility will have maybe one physiotherapist on staff, maybe uh, one occupational therapist, and a couple part-time recreation therapists. But they really struggle. Um, to provide either the group or the individualized exercise that is needed. Like, they stress that like exercise is available to everyone who's interested. Like, that's just that's the barrier. It's not like oh, so and so's not able to exercise because they're in a wheelchair. That's never the barrier. The barrier is always like the level of interest. So you know, I think. That there's a challenge and there's a need to be creative and to introduce and to somehow get uh, you know people on board whether it's health authorities or individual homes or provincial government but this is a problem that's not going away uh, I kind of joke that um, I picked a problem that I'm not really going to solve like my my, so my my version of solving a problem is that the average age of the fall or the average age of a hip fracture patient is like 95 instead of like 82. But um, the need is not going to go away. The challenge is, is tremendous, but I think kinesiologists are you know, as well poised as, as anyone to really be leaders in this field. Oh, Sonia just wrote to us this one question again. So I think Sonia is writing to us. Um, so for long-term care, I think she's writing to us from my bra. From long-term care, have you found a good head protection gear that can help with preventing head injuries? Good question. Um, I'd say like send that question to me next year. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we we start with like like we did a study, and and I should make sure to. Um, because his name is not up here, when I mentioned like we do a lot of work with Razor Health, really that is, is this partnership with Fabio Feldman, who um, is manager for injury prevention at Fraser Health, um, and we, it's just been a really productive, fruitful partnership with him for many years. But um, Fabio did an assessment, a brief assessment of like how many older adults in long-term care who are falling, who are hitting their head when they fall, would be willing to wear uh, helmets. <laughs> Very few. So then we start with, so, so the question for me is not like, are you willing to wear a helmet? The question is like, what are you willing to wear? So maybe it's a baseball cap that has like a quarter inch, you know, foam padding. Maybe it's like, you know, Mrs. Smith wears a wig every day and she doesn't mind having the padding in the wig. Um, those are kind of the low cost end solutions, similar to the stick on hip protector. We're also working on fancier approaches that would just prevent, you know, reduce the likelihood that someone would impact their head in the fall. Like a toque that then is I'm falling in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I need to, again, back to the exercises she asked that you may have, oh, and there's another one coming too. But Tony said, what specific exercises would you suggest to prevent falls? And I know you were talking about core and core stability. Prevent falls. Yeah. To prevent, or prevent injury. Prevent falls in elderly population. Prevent well, that's worth reviewing. And, and she said, and also okay. to prevent the injuries if they do fall. Okay. Right? And so, I'm just going back. Yeah. So they can. Um, and there's a, there's a good article that I'll refer people to that just came out in JAMA. Uh, Journal of the American Medical Association that did uh, 
meta-analysis, like a review of um, exercise programs for fall prevention. And I think the, you know, continued message is like you can't target just strength. Yes, strength is important, but it has to have balance and agility training components. Um, so more and more you see things like dance dance revolution sort of versions of, uh, you know, quick stepping and coordination and, um, but that's very important. Um, the components like I mentioned that we are adding um, are really focusing right now on strength, although you might say like the next step might be to somehow, you know, simulate with a perturbation or something. But um, core strength, like if you think about those backward falls, like that's where, you know, over one in ten falls in older adults in this uh, scenario, they fall, they, they impact the back of their head. So is it the neck, is it the core? Um, we don't know if strengthening alone will improve things, but it's some place to start. Upper limb is the other big thing that we're focusing on, and, and sort of it came together to us like, yeah, the upper limb is so important for avoiding injury, and it's so important also during transferring, like just use of the arms and rising and sitting down, and it's really in the neglected area in uh, exercise for the most part in older adults. Exercises, <laughs> <laughs> so what you're, what you're telling me there is <coughs> the ability to decelerate the body is very important to prevent the injury. Yes. So if you were doing something like they talk about doing, if you do a dropped wall push-up to slow yourself down, so you've got the seniors to practice drop wall push-ups. Exactly. And that's in fact, uh, not, not with a drop yet, but rather just like, you know, an inclined push-up against the wall. They, they are doing that. Too. Yeah. And, you know, you'd be surprised, I, I mean, I was surprised, many of you will not be, of, you know, that it's not just strength, it's flexibility as well, like, just shoulder mobility is so what much, you know. What's a drop wall push-up? You actually drop yourself down. into the wall, so. So if you were here, you wouldn't just lean against the wall, you'd start with your fingers. 15 centimeters away from the wall, and then you oh, catch okay. yourself to the middle. Oh, okay, okay. So there's an impact that you have to catch rather than mm -hmm. already being on the wall. Yeah. So there, there, there's a better, there's more inertia when you do a drop wall push up. And maybe just briefly come back to the story that I don't think I really uh, finished, but let's say, um, okay, so this, well, where's this location come from? But let's say you, with you know, you're a 92 year old woman and you have lost your upper limb strength and mobility and inherently somehow know that if I fell forward, there's no way, and I landed forward, there's no way I could prevent my head from impacting. It's kind of a scenario you might think about, like, let's say you're walking um, and you fall forward and your hands are literally stuck in your pockets. Or, you know, you're holding something really precious like a baby or, you know, what would you do? You're falling forward. So, <coughs> you think about rotating, like that's really the only way to protect yourself. To land sideways or even rotate all the way backwards. So, are people as they age, where we see this really strong tendency, actually, you know, voluntarily, you know, thinking like as they're falling, like, oh, you know, I've got to rotate? No. But I think we all have these sort of, you know, what we think of as internal models, like, you know, how we can accomplish things. And if you have loss of the effectiveness of upper limb responses, it's certainly not surprising that you might start favoring other strategies. And I think that's really what we're seeing here. Because, like, we're rarely seeing people rotate from sideways to forward or backward to forward. Like, I have no more questions. Okay. Um, I, I know that in the past there's been research done here for BC Transit, so the Transit Authority is on following. Do you have any information to share on well, that? Well, that's interesting because um, we did a study uh, and uh, it, was, it was interesting that BC Transit contacts after the study saying, oh, that's great, like maybe we want to do something together, but uh, initially they didn't seem to be too interested. Um, perhaps they didn't know what we might reveal about the risk of standing on a moving bus. But we just looked at handrail stability and like how, um, what's the effort involved in recovering balance on our platform perturbation 
um, if you're standing forward to bus motion or sideways if you're grasping overhead or uh, shoulder height. And yeah, the results were not that surprising. But um, again, I think that's a big area of growth. Um, you know, how many seats are going to be available for every older person that we want to encourage to ride the bus? Um, I met an older guy who um, refused to take the seat. He was like in his 90s, and that was his exercise. He loved, you know, like practicing the lateral stability and so on. Well, Han just did a follow-up and said, I've been working in Vancouver with various populations, some in their homes, others in care facilities. My elderly patients exhibit issues with inner dysfunction, I think he means inner ear, he asked about the ear or ear, that has led to imbalance and finally to falls. However, the point made regarding an out outdoor uneven surface helping to mediate falling is interesting. So just a comment. Yeah, to give them that practice. <clears throat> I mean, a vestibular dysfunction in itself may not lead to falls if vision and proprioception is intact. It's when two out of three of them are impaired that you have a big problem. Anyway, I think we're done. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good, Jane? Yep. Okay.